Okay, so we've hit 12.30, uh, we'll get started here. Um, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the third webinar in our Service Innovation Series. Uh, we're delighted to welcome Christian Kowalkowski, who is our guest speaker today. Um, Christian is an expert in the, in the field of servitization and has worked with uh, a number of international firms in developing service-led strategies. So we're, we're set for a really fascinating discussion today um, with examples from some of, these, some of the companies he's worked with and the innovative strategies they've developed. Um, before we begin, just a, just a few housekeeping rules. Um, so all lines are on mute. Um, however, we want today's session to be as interactive as possible. So please post your questions into the chat box you'll see on the, on the right-hand side. Um, and today's session is, al is also being recorded, so we'll be sent out in the next two to three days after the, after the session. Um, so without further ado, I will, I will pass you to, over to Christian. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Um, it's a pleasure to talk about one of the topics I'm very passionate about, which is service innovation in product firms. And uh, let's just connect the video here. <coughs> So before I start, I just would like to say a few brief words about myself. I'm an associate professor of industrial marketing, uh, working at the Institute of Technology at Linköping University, and also at Hanken School of Economics. And for over 10 years now, I've been conducting research on service growth and also service innovation solutions marketing in various product-centric firms big multinationals such as Toyota Material Handling, but also some smaller companies. And I'm also involved in teaching activities, uh, which is also trying to combine my, my research and tapping that into uh, teaching. So I've developed, for instance, Sweden's first university course on industrial service development almost 10 years ago. So I have 50, 60 master level students every year that uh, I also share my interest in this topic. And as you all know, service-led growth is ubiquitous. It's taking place across the economies in a wide range of different companies. Most often we hear about it uh, taking place in business-to-business -business manufacturing companies such as Otis, Caterpillar, G, IBM, and others. And there are a vast number of different reasons for this, either as a defensive stance to protect the core business or a more proactive uh, strategy uh, for growth. It could be flat product markets, uh, increased competition from low-cost countries, uh, pure service players, smaller agile firms, or new competitors from completely different industries, such as software firms. Uh, coming in and taking the customer interface, or customers putting pressure on companies to, to evolve their service business. But it might also be more proactive, such as exploiting product and technology expertise, or to use services to get more value out of the customer relationship, or to open totally new market opportunities through business model innovation and more disruptive types of innovation as well. But before I start, I would just like to, to also broaden the perspective and say that while this is the case, uh, obviously service-led growth, servitization, is not limited just to the traditional B2B manufacturers. Also traditional service firms such as retailers can successfully grow deeper into value-added services by adopting more of a service-centric approach. And one such company is PetSmart, which is North America's largest specialty retailer of products and services for the lifetime needs of pets. And over the years, they have really redefined the customer job that the company engages in. Instead of just focusing on pushing boxes from the retail shelf into the customer's shopping carts, they nowadays holistically address the needs of pets 
as family members and of course also the needs of the pet owner and they provide such things as pet's hotel what they call doggy day camp grooming services and of course different types of vet services so again we have these growth opportunities across different industries different sectors of the economy which i find very intriguing however i will keep this presentation focusing on traditional b2b and manufacturers and, and provide such examples so uh, just a short overview of uh, the content of today. I will start by briefly talking about uh, why I find a business model perspective on service innovation useful for analytical purposes, for strategizing, and then look into some specific critical resources and distinct capabilities related to each business model element. Uh, and also along the way provide some company examples and service specific traits uh, related to the business model. <clears throat> so starting with a, why, why take such a broad perspective? Well, I believe that the strategic shift to services and solutions has to be, really be mirrored in changes throughout the entire business model. Because in general, that's my experience from working with companies they tend to place too much emphasis on just expanding the service portfolio. So too much emphasis on new service concept development without adjusting and reconfiguring also other business model elements that are needed to change or in, in order to seize these service opportunities. So essentially then successful change in one element also depends on corresponding changes in the other. And this has gained a lot of traction ever since, in particular since uh, the very well-known book, Business Model Generation by Osterwalder and Pignor. They really popularized uh, the business model canvas. And I will here also use a canvas, although a different one, more service specific one, uh, as a strategizing framework. So essentially, this is one way of illustrating a service business model. And you might be familiar with all of the elements here. We have the strategy and the structure on top, and then eight other also distinct business model elements, each with their specific resources and distinct capabilities. So starting at the top, I will briefly go through the strategy and structure, and then the remaining eight elements and uh, looking forward and also to, to you taking your questions at the end of the session. So obviously service-led growth is a, a big strategic change to many companies and uh, to, to do this companies also have to ask themselves uh, several questions. One of them is of course what, what's the purpose of why do we want to grow our service business? Do we want to do uh, the IBM type of service transition, which essentially is going from products and hardware to software and services, so really leaving the traditional business behind? Or is it more about service infusion, infusing services into the product business and successfully combining various product service combinations into innovative hybrid solutions? And do we want to do that mainly to defend and enhance the product business, this very pro protective stance? Or is it really also to build a new service-led business on its own that might be successful and potentially also, of course, compete with the product business, which is a totally different game to play? Typically, companies also, in order to grow, uh, do this both organically but also through strategic uh, acquisitions. Could be, of course, acquisitions of channel partners in order to come even close to the customers. Could it be specialized service providers offering advanced services and uh, processing skills the company do not have. But it could also be pro acquisition of product companies that have a large installed base of equipment that they currently do not address 
through services because they are indeed truly product centric. So the acquisition of product companies might actually also allow for potential service growth and profits through the service business. Then the question is also, should we as a company do the services ourselves or should we delegate it to the dealers? And typically, a product central company would happily delegate most of the service activities to dealers, enabling them to focus on the core product business. But the more service centric the company is, the more important it is to recognize that, that having the customer relationship, the customer interface really is being close to the customer, the market, being able to control the market channel. And then many companies tend to try to internalize uh, more of the service activities. From a strategic point of view, it's also important to, to create awareness of the service opportunities at hand and to create the sense of urgency of change. Successful product companies tend to be rather reluctant to, to, to change. Uh, but we see that also in traditional markets, change, we have technology advances and other changes, new entrants coming in, also from other industries, uh, as well as the low cost competition. So change might happen whether or not the company acts. So creating a sense of urgency then becomes important. And we see this in the case I'm working in Finland with Nokia, for instance. Former CEO Steve Elop says that said that well we our business is essentially a burning product platform and in the case of Nokia it was too late to change the sense of urgency came too late so of course it's ideal to change when the situation uh, is not that bad although that's always more more difficult for companies to do and change is also about changing the organizational structure because in order to, to facilitate service growth, companies need to find an appropriate uh, structure. The question here is how to balance centralization and local autonomy and in general for services. Of course, you need to have a strong local presence and sensitivity for local and customer specific differences. So there is a danger of taking global efficiency and centralization too far if you at the same time want to um, grow through services. Then there is also the question of should we separate the service business as an independent unit or should we integrate it into, uh, with the product business? And uh, here I would say it really depends on in what phase of the service transformation you're in. Uh, we can see what, what my research shows and also other colleagues uh, is that typically at the start of the service transition, transition journey, companies need to establish separate service units to, that are clearly committed and dedicated to services, profit loss responsibility, dedicated resources, staff and so forth. But as they move along the way and develop more complex services, it's also important to foster the strategic linkages between the product and the service business, especially if you want to offer solutions and other types of product service uh, offerings. So uh, then you really need to, to potentially reintegrate the businesses because the interdependence between products and services again increases. And the same if you work with key account management and so forth having one interface, uh, one customer facing unit. Uh, so this issue of separation and integration is clearly very important also. And there is not one, no one size fits all structure here really. It really depends on where in the transformation you're in, what type of services you're offering and so forth. Going to the other eight elements here, uh, a typical starting point would be the service offering. So what, what type of services should we offer? And <clears throat> for a product company, uh, it's usually, I would say, fairly easy to, to, to classify the type of products uh, they're offering. But 
services can be so much more. It can span from basic customer support to various types of field services, proactive, reactive ones, customer training, consultancy, optimization, efficiency services, uh, taking over of entire operations, uh, and all then various types of availability and performance-based contracts as well. So it's useful then to have uh, a service classification framework to, to in order to, to as a starting point. And one useful way of distinguishing different types of services is to make a distinction between services focusing on the supplier's products, such as traditional repair and maintenance services, which is about well ensuring the proper functionality of the product. And then process-oriented services, such as customer training, education, or optimization of an entire production plant. And then also the nature of the value proposition or the revenue model, if you like. What is that nature? Is it input-based, such as recovery, the product breaking down, we need to recover it, supporting the customer through training, or is it output, focusing on availability, such as 95% uptime of the bus fleet in a city, or performance? <clears throat> Anyone from the UK would be familiar with the Rolls-Royce Powered by the Hour solutions, where customers pay for the performance for the actual not flight hours, which is when the customer earns money, when the aircraft is up in the air. So that type of complex performance-based agreements. And then we end up with a two-dimensional framework with the six uh, distinct types of uh, services. Uh, service focus on one hand, and then the revenue model on the other hand. And uh, I will not go uh, into detail here discussing this, but please feel free to ask questions. Uh, if you have any, then we can take them up afterwards. And, but usually what, what you hear if you read what consultants write and others, it, it, that you should really try to climb the value ladder. And the higher up, the better. The better are the potential rewards. Uh, but you also have a lot of pains and risks by climbing up and uh, to the right in this box, to the customer solution corner. So uh, while you see some successful examples as Rolls Royce, other cases, um, you see also failures, companies unable to make profits. All companies actually deliberately saying that we are happy not being in all of these boxes. We want to focus on, on some of them. So while you have Rolls-Royce uh, with a power by the hour offering in the customer solution square, uh, Toyota material handling, uh, would be more focusing on process availability services, such as rental plans. So if you take a market like the UK, a majority of new warehouse and forklift trucks, they are not sold on the market, but they are actually uh, being part of the rental plans uh, that are being sold to customers for five, six, seven years perhaps. Uh, and then customers pay a fixed fee, monthly fee for guaranteed availability. And traditionally, Toyota has said they prefer to be in this box rather than in the customer solution box uh, offering performance because the system scope is more or less the same, but the risks are higher and customers are not willing to compensate for that risk necessarily, uh, as this implies. So it's always important then to, to be aware where are we today, uh, what are our growth targets, growth ambitions, for the future, uh, and where do we not want to be as well in such a service framework. And revenue models I already touched upon, uh, and essentially we have the input and the output-based ones, um, the input-based being the traditional uh, charging for service hours, spare parts sold. Output-based could look very different, but typically you have the fixed fee ones like Toyota, or more value-based dynamic ones, uh, more closely linked to, to customer output. Uh, but here, what, what can be 
bit challenging for many companies is actually to manage both of them in parallel because that is typically the case for many companies. You have both the traditional input-based model and the output-based ones. And for smaller companies, that might also then be evident on an individual level that you have to be able to, to, to shift revenue logic, such as service technicians before lunch, working in more reactive mode, uh, charging for the service hours uh, for a particular customer, after lunch, traveling to another customer that has this service contract, fixed fee contract, uh, and then every unnecessary or additional service hour, if you like, uh, directly, of course, affects the bottom line of the company. Then it's also important to look at the processes. And here I deliberately distinguished between the development, sales, and delivery processes, because each and every one of them uh, has some service-specific uh, um, traits that are important to recognize when working with innovation and uh, business development. So if we start with the development processes, uh, a typical mistake many companies do is that they think that, well, service development, isn't it almost the same as product development? And whereas you should really recognize that service innovation in a number of different ways uh, differ from product innovation. This is just one way of illustrating this in terms of the resource requirements and time needed throughout uh, development project. This is something I've elaborated on with a couple of service managers in a workshop some years ago when we actually discussed why is it so that companies have a lot of very interesting and intriguing service uh, concepts, but they somehow fail to take off. When they try to launch them, they don't achieve the success they expected. There are a number of different reasons for this, of course, but one is that companies don't allocate the right resources to service development because they see it too much as product development. In a product development case, a lot of resources are required in the initial phases of the project. It's usually resource demanding, taking a lot of time to come up with physical prototypes, things like that. But once you have uh, the product in place, you've set up the uh, manufacturing facilities, uh, you can scale up production fast, and you can roll it out and deliver it throughout your uh, channels uh, worldwide. Uh, rather straightforward compared to service. You can actually develop the service uh, concept quite easily. Of course, it's not easy, but in comparison to the physical prototypes and the effort required with product development, then it's easier with services, I would say. Uh, you do the service blueprinting, you can do business model canvas, work with different tools and methods uh, to develop the concept. But that's not uh, the most difficult part of the journey. That's just when the journey started. So. What you really then need to do is to put resources and effort into the sales and delivery processes as well. Training the service sales force, uh, the delivery organization, ensuring that you have the right infrastructure in place, uh, that salespeople know what to sell, they have the commitment, and they have the right support that's the engineers, you have the right engineers in place, and so forth. So the resources and time needed uh, is, is one reason why uh, many initiatives never really take off. And one company that recognized this was Volvo, Volvo Group, the truck and bus manufacturer, because they've been working for many, many years with specific product development processes and also one for ISIT. Uh, and then, many years ago, they also developed a very ambitious service growth strategy. So they've been committed to service growth for many years now. And then they recognized also that 
our existing product development process is not suitable for service-led growth because the structures, processes, and routines are too rigid. We need a more flexible and iterative process with increased customer involvement throughout the process in ideation, concept development, as well as pilot testing and evaluation, uh, and also to secure resources and competence for sales and delivery, just as I mentioned, and closer collaboration between different internal functions, also product development, because design for service is also important uh, for, for the product uh, point of view, and as well as closer collaboration between central and local units. For instance, such as taking into account that idea generation very often takes place at the local level in interaction with customers. And this is then in stark contrast to a typical product development process where the majority of these activities take place in central R&D units. So here we have local uh, organization being involved uh, playing a key role in a very, very different way. Then in terms of sales, to somewhat simplify, it's about going from a, this hunter uh, persuasion model to, to the farmer's co-creation model. And you see a lot of sales managers saying that, well, product salespeople are from March and service salespeople are from Venus. It's really a different type of sales person that you need, someone that is not focusing on turning products into cash flow, but has a genuine interest in customer problem solving. So shifting the sales focus to the customer's process, or even one step further, having this thorough understanding of the customer's customer, uh, which might be needed in order to make the customer's business model more competitive, and thereby crafting a more compelling value proposition for the customer. Uh, so it's more on, on about focusing on shared growth and contract renewal than just selling more products uh, per se. And again, it's, services are, are a different animal and uh, more intangible. You have more intangible value elements. So it's also about developing the tools and methods to visualize customer value convincingly beforehand, something that, for instance, SKF, the bearing manufacturer, has been very successful doing. So they document the customer value uh, that is achieved throughout the, through their product and service contracts and uh, have this great uh, internal database with thousands of cases that salespeople can access and that can help them when negotiating and discussing with customers. And then finally, we have the service delivery process. Uh, because manufacturing production is a, typically seen as a closed production system, but service production is, is really different. It's an open system uh, in which also the customers are involved. So. In some cases, the customers play a key role for service production, such as self-service. Uh, but in many cases, what customers do is that they outsource the service activities to the supplier, but they still uh, interact and uh, take part uh, in the production process one way or the other. So there is actually a risk of thinking too much in terms of productivity from a product-centric view when talking about service delivery and service production. Companies may in fact be too efficient if you measure productivity from a strict uh, production um, point of view. And one example of that is Orga, Linda Gas, the industrial gas supplier. They've been very successful with service innovation in the Nordic region, uh, working with that for well over a decade now. And they recognize that we have this advantage. We have an internal uh, service uh, technician organization. Uh, so not working with service partners, they have the internal organization, which is for them a benefit when launching new services and delivering them. 
but they were actually working not uh, tapping into the customer relationship as a strategic asset as good as they could. So they were actually doing sometimes their job too efficient. So you could find a technician arriving at the customer site, doing a safety inspection, replacing bottles, without the customer hardly noticing he has been there. So they said that how can we utilize the relationship uh, as a strategic asset in a better way uh, while still being efficient, of course, uh, and doing this in a standardized way. And this is the, then, that's what you see in this picture. This is the first part of what they call the photo story of how they wanted the technicians to act when working with customers. So it's about finding, developing a standardized script for the technicians, while at the same time ensuring that they interact with the customer. So as you see here, they inform the customer of arrival, they explain the work to be done based on the agreed protocol and so forth. And this is then a great way to get to know what is the current status of the customer's business. Are there any potential problems that have occurred? Also, it's a way to identify sales opportunities for products and services. And as you know, usually customers put a lot of trust into these service technicians that they've been working with for, for many years, much more so than with salespeople in general. So a great opportunity to, to foster and develop uh, the day-to-day -day customer relationship. And if you look at this strictly from an efficiency point of view, this might be some opportunities that you actually don't take into account. So this is one aspect of service delivery that's important. And it also relates to the relationship, which is the next element of the business model here. And, and services, of course, influence the customer relationship. If you move into advanced services and solutions, that requires long-term orientation and, and so forth. But it also could be a key reason for developing the service business the will to become a more strategic partner to the customers, of course. But if you would contrast service and product uh, settings, in a basic product setting, you mainly have a relationship uh, between the sales person or sales manager and the purchasing uh, manager, as on the left side figure here. Whereas for services, what becomes important is multiple interfaces with multiple stakeholders in the customer organization. For advanced services, take power by the hour or uh, rental plans, uh, these deals are not made uh, necessarily uh, between sales managers and purchasing managers, but on the, between the top management uh, level in the organizations. So we have to reach higher up in the customer organization, recognizing that the buyer center, buying center for services is not the same as the buying center for the product. There are different key stakeholders involved that might influence the process. And at the same time, if you have a service contract spanning several years, evidently you need to foster the local relationships, the day-to-day -day relationships need to work. And that's also a great way to, to to learn and to get feedback from the service operations in the field. However, services require not only alignment and closer collaboration with customers, but also with the overall value network and the channel partners in the value network. And uh, in order to strengthen it, uh, coordination and collaboration are two key components. Uh, having control of the service channel through better co coordination and, and also then this collaborative mode, working more closely with uh, the channel partners. Because that fast, close relationship is not necessarily needed for product sales, uh, which, uh, but for services, it's, it's much more important. And uh, what sometimes surprises me is that you see 
leading product manufacturers uh, that have very good relationships on a, the product side with the dealers and they know uh, their knowledge. But then when it comes to commitment and competence for the services, they do not know uh, if the partners are committed at all to the service initiative. And then, of course, it's very risky uh, if you are about to launch new services that the dealers are supposed to sell and deliver. If they are not committed, that is a big risk, also for the brand uh, overall. And so these are all then very important components to take into account and to really understand the commitment and the competence of the dealers as well. Uh, picking the right dealers when launching services, so you launch the service in the right order. And one ex recent example of that is uh, Husqvarna, uh, the lawnmower manufacturer that is has developed a quite intriguing uh, fleet service concept to help the landscapers to be, become more productive and to also increase the safety of uh, the drivers. And they traditionally operate with through a network of multi-brand dealers, which pose even bigger challenges many times if you have dealers that sell also other brands, of course, in terms of loyalty and incentives. Uh, and in this business, what customers typically do is that they run the machines until they break down, and then they leave them at the dealer workshop. So a very reactive way of, of uh, doing business, uh, really, whereas now Husqvarna wants to move into a more proactive and service-centric mode. And in order to do this, they have been working very closely with key customers and dealers on a number of different markets to really understand uh, how to develop a value proposition that resonates both with the users but also with the dealers. So how could they develop a service concept that dealers will be willing to actually sell and then to actually follow these service plans and work according to them, those. And it's still in a pilot phase, uh, what they call the beta mode, but they launched it in a number of uh, markets. Uh, they are involving key dealers and are actively supporting them so that sales organizations are working very closely with the local dealers, uh, supporting them as they are learning how to conduct this service business. So again, this shows uh, that service innovation and development is different. This would not be possible to launch wide scale in several countries as, at once. We really have to uh, grow this incrementally, starting with some key dealers and at the key markets, and then evaluate and adjust and and continue to scale it up. Then finally, you, we have culture, which is the softer business model element. Typically, you don't find it in business model frameworks, uh, but I think it's useful also to include this, because among the barriers to service growth, of course, you find a lot of the structural barriers, but many of the barriers are also uh, cognitive related to the mindsets, the mental models of decision makers and others in the organization, and of course also in the value network. Uh, so really a litmus test for determining whether a company is really service-centric or not is to ask managers, salespeople and others if they are really ready to cannibalize their traditional product business because service infusion might have that effect uh, if you take it far enough that you actually sell fewer products. This is the case with Toyota material handling when they are offering rental plans. So they optimize the material handling flow uh, at the customer work, uh, warehouse, uh, which also often means that fewer trucks are needed, but the ones that um, 
are used are used much more efficiently. Another example would be in the office equipment industry, when Xerox moved into business process outsourcing, document solutions, uh, some big customers halved the num their installed base. Uh, only half of the office equipment was needed. And of course, that's counterintuitive for a business that's all its life been focusing on selling products. And not only is it counterintuitive, it might also create a lot of friction and active resistance by those feeling threatened by the new service initiatives. So you have these political costs and tensions also to take into account. So how we are service activities viewed in the organization is an important issue to consider. Is the service viewed merely as after-sales services, which then indicates it's some form of afterthought coming after the main uh, activity, which is this noble sale of the product? But if service is to be a strategic priority, it has to be much more integrated. Uh, and what's required then, of course, is strong service leadership, long-term orientation to service growth, but also the ability to show short-term gains, because there are a lot of low-hanging fruits along the service transition journey, and being able to, to show them and to celebrate those gains. Activities such as the appointment of service champions at various levels and uh, units in the organization is also important. And of course, to direct the energy and resources to the service business. But also, to this is not about throwing out the product culture entirely, of course. Uh, many times, successful service growth requires world-class products. Among the examples I talked about today, I mean, these companies would not be successful in terms of services if they would not have had world-class products. So they still have to maintain a strong and proud product and engineering culture. But at the same time, you need to have a service culture as well in the organization. And you need to, to foster the two in parallel and to balance them. And then, of course, manage the potential tensions that you see between those two. So that would be this overall business model perspective uh, then. And of course, a final question could be, where do you start uh, if you want to grow the service business? Do you start on the strategic level? Usually you have some type of strategic intent, of course, to grow the service business. Do you then start with the offering? discussing what, how to grow, what types of services to offer. That, of course, might be one option. Another could be to start also in some of the other elements, such as customer relationship. How can we uh, grow stronger customer relationships? What is then needed? And, and that, take that as a starting point, if that's what's in focus and uh, strategically for the company. In other cases, it might be managing the value network, maybe a third-party threat that is um, has to be somehow overcome. And again, you have the cultural aspects that take a long time to change. So that also has to be focused on um, along the way. So with those words, I would like to thank you all for listening, for your attention. Uh, before we start with the questions, uh, we'd just like to say that if you are interested in uh, reading some of my academic work, you can find free versions of most of my articles, including the one that this one is, uh, presentation is based on, on my website. Uh, and if you are interested in uh, the 12-step roadmap to service growth that I'm uh, writing a managerial book about, uh, send me an email and I will notify you once it's on Amazon uh, this autumn. So, uh, again, thank you very much. Perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, Christian. Really fascinating uh, discussion there. And, and as I said earlier, we'll, we'll send out Christian's details um, as well as the recording of the webinar after the uh, 
in two to three days. Um, so if we have any questions, as I mentioned at the start of the uh, discussion, please um, post them in the, in the chat box and we'll get those to, to Christian. Just, just to kick off, um, a couple of questions have come in. So one question was around uh, the impact of the Internet of Things. And, um, do you see that as a kind of an accelerator for product-centric firms transitioning to kind of service-led um, strategies? Absolutely, um, absolutely. I mean, this is this is having a huge impact on the service growth opportunities, uh, of course, on all the business operations, but especially on service service growth in in companies. And uh, at the same time, this is a double-edged sword, I would say, because you have all these opportunities and to tap into. The cust working closer with the customer. Uh, at the same time, you also have the temptation of developing things just because they are technically possible to offer. So there are also examples of companies that are actually struggling with these technology-enabled services because they focus too much on what's technically possible without taking the customer as the starting point. So you, you should still, I mean, it's, important uh, to combine the two, the technological opportunities, but really starting outside, taking this outside-in approach, starting with the customer. How can we facilitate the customer value creation through this new technology rather than what can we do with the technology per se? So the classical mistake is sometimes being made also in the service business. Okay, thank you for thank you for that answer. Um, second question has come in is so you touched a little bit on on uh, culture at the end of the presentation. What do you think is the single biggest barrier to change, um, especially for some of the co companies you've conducted research on? Is culture kind of the main main barrier? Would you say or yes? Uh, I think that I mean culture is is. Uh, can mean a lot of different things, but but I think that typically culture and the softer aspects are more difficult to change than the harder ones. You can acquire uh, new resources if if you like, but but changing the uh, way people operate the business, changing the way salespeople act, I mean those things are are more difficult for sure. Absolutely. Um, and then final question, I think, uh, unless there's any, any more for the, for the chat box. Um, what would be your advice to someone, someone thinking about launching uh, these service-led initiatives approaches at their company? Where would be the first place to start or best piece of advice that you could give? I would say that have, uh, have in mind that this uh, might take longer than expected uh, and make sure that you have formed because this is also a lot about change management so you have a strong alliance of key people uh, that are dedicated and committed to, to service growth I mean it's, it's impossible to get everyone on board but but you have the critical mass of the right people in the different local and central units uh, at different levels in the organization to this uh, service initiative. And then not to start necessarily, I mean, maybe you're standing on a burning product platform and you have to really act quickly, but there are also risks uh, of, of being too ambitious and expanding too fast. At the Huskfon example, for instance, I mean, that's a big company uh, and they've been developing this for many years. But still, they take this very, I think, intelligent uh, approach, not launching it worldwide or in all of Europe, but working on, with a few key markets, with a few key dealers that's been involved also in, earlier in the development process. So they know they have the competence and the commitment. And they have then the control of the service channel, uh, Husqvarna, if you like. So, so I would say that's if possible, that could also be, be a good thing to have in mind. So long long answer to, to, to that question, though, but uh, 
Um, it's, it's always hard to generalize, but, but that would be my, my, my advice. Absolutely. So thank you. So yeah, as we said earlier, um, Christine's contact details are, are on screen and, and uh, will be sent out with the webinar. So if there's any further questions for him, um, we can arrange for that um, after the webinar. But that, I think that's every, all the questions that have come in for today. Um, so thank you everyone again for, for joining. Um, our next session in this series is with, with Chris Daffy, who is uh, an expert in customer service, um, and that's on the 24th of May, so look out for details on that one and the next one in the series. Um, I'd like to thank Christine again for a really fascinating presentation today. I really enjoyed it, um, and please look out for the follow-up follow in the next couple of days. Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much. Thank you all for, for listening. Thanks. Bye-bye.